Welcome back to my channel everyone for yet another Desperate Housewives video. Desperate Housewives season 5 was definitely one of the stronger seasons and I want to talk about why. I'm currently on season 7 and I'm trying to work my way through to the end of the show before I do an overall review. This is probably my favourite season after season 3 because of how different it was. It was just super refreshing. It's so good, like genuinely. I've never laughed aloud so much watching a show in a long time. So that's what we're talking about today and if you want to see my other videos about the show those videos will be in the description and I've got a whole Desperate Housewives playlist for you guys to binge watch and I just want to show you my outfit today because it's really cute. So I've got this really pretty flowery top and then this silky skirt. It's really cute actually. I do like it. So season five of Desperate Housewives was really interesting because we experienced a time jump into the future which I didn't like at first because I found it very rushed and clumsy but I've settled into it now so it's fine. Here are some of the main plot points. Brie becomes the driving force behind a successful catering company and releasing her own book with her cooking secrets that actually is really successful but this results in her being a bit arrogant at points so it creates a rift in her relationships. And Terry Hatcher who plays Susan said that the new fashion style and looks for all the women reflect how they've changed now. Lynette deals with her husband going through a midlife crisis rebellious children and financial issues that take a toll on her. As for Susan, she's now divorced from Mike. How many times can these guys break up for God's sake? And she's having this friends with benefits situation with a guy called Jackson, even though she really still wants Mike. Then Catherine, her friend, becomes romantically involved with Mike. Um, so yeah. Her personality also completely changes and she becomes this very sweet, nice nurturing woman even though when she was introduced in season four like I said she's trying to be queen bee and top dog and she's being very intense and manipulative and now she's just behaving like a woman that only wants to be loved and is really vulnerable and it was very weird like this drastic shift in personality. As for Gabby she becomes the mum of two bratty girls and her husband Carlos is blind so she's got to deal with taking care of him and then he gets his sight back and goes back into work and she has to deal with remembering how their relationship used to be when he was working all the time and wasn't emotionally available to her which is what caused so many struggles for them in season one and since that pattern starts to happen again in season five it kind of freaks her out but the mystery is what I want to talk about first before I break down each of the women and what happens to them. Edie, the outcasted girl, <laughs> returns to town with a new husband in tow who the other women have never met before and he's called Dave and he is the main villain and mystery of this season and he is an excellent villain. I mean he's not perfect but he's entertaining, he's scheming and he has a revenge agenda against Mike and Susan. They did something bad that affected him personally and it was a very upsetting backstory so he wants revenge on them. The only person who starts cluing on to his weirdness is Mrs. McCluskey. Mike does at points but Mrs. McCluskey is really on it so there's this hilarious subplot where she hires her sister and they're almost like these detectives doing this background work on Dave and trying to figure out what's wrong with him. We know that Dave came from a hospital for the criminally insane and this doctor who used to help him comes to Wisteria Lane and asks Dave what are you doing here and then Dave kills him and covers up the body and sets this whole club on fire so that no one will find out and then Dave saves Mike in the fire and pretends to be this hero even though he was the one that set the fire in the first place and in the season finale it accumulates with Dave trying to kill Susan's son and then luckily he backs out at the last minute and so it's not half as bad as it could have been. The kid's fine. At the end Mrs. McCluskey and Roberta had coincidentally teamed up with the detectives because they had information and they together realized the true identity of David and it was honestly a very juicy mystery. The only thing that made me a bit sad is the fact that Dave was so obviously suspicious and the whole season we know and it's made very clear that he hates Mike and Susan. It kind of takes the intrigue out of it because we know exactly what he's planning and what he wants to do so I wish they could have made it a bit less obvious perhaps or not revealed his intentions until maybe halfway through the season because from the minute he arrived it was made obvious that 
he had bad intent. The first character I want to talk about is Susan because I know she's the housewife who tends to get the most criticism and controversy. Susan and Mike divorced after a car crash that really tore their relationship apart because they kept having arguments about it. Susan, as we know, likes to really ruminate over issues rather than moving on, so I could totally understand why that would cause a divorce. So at least that made sense to me. They do have a kid together though, so that makes it complicated because they still need to co-parent, even when she moves on and is dating Jackson. And when he moves on and starts dating Catherine, I'll get into that later, they sort of have to negotiate there being multiple mother and father figures in their son MJ's life. MJ is adorable by the way, shout out to the actor, he's so cute. Jackson really wants to take things to the next level with Susan, but she's still keeping him at a distance because she's worried about getting hurt again. Susan is really jealous when she finds out that Mike bought Catherine these expensive, well seemingly expensive pearls, she assumes they were expensive, and yet he apparently can't afford to send MJ to private school, and for some reason it's really important to Susan that MJ goes to private school. She ends up breaking into Catherine's house to steal the pearls, and then it results in this very embarrassing scenario where Mike's forced to admit that the pearls were very cheap and he couldn't afford them to be new. What complicates it is that Susan still likes Mike and Catherine can tell that Mike may still like Susan and so there's this resentment there that Catherine has for Susan that really significantly damages their friendship. One thing I find weird is that Susan was never going to be consoled by her daughter Julie or ask Julie for advice. I know that Julie's off at uni at this point in this season because of the time jump or what working or something, but it's so strange to me that she wouldn't be calling her daughter constantly and asking her for advice because in the earlier seasons of the show, Susan had such a codependent relationship with her daughter. She was always asking her for advice, always saying, please, how can you help me? And now she's basically figuring everything out on her own, which I just don't think is very characteristic of Susan. Even though Susan had her issues in season five, I really liked her in about the first six episodes. I thought she was super sweet and hilarious. I definitely find her the funniest out of all the women. She's being really sweet trying to protect her son when he's being bullied and she really does try her best to accommodate some kind of relationship between Jackson and Mike and even though I didn't like Susan's personality as season five went on, I thought it had a really strong start and also she just has this drunk energy that I find so funny. Like at the nightclub before the fire started she was dancing around like this, just so weird. I was like what are you doing? Like when you look at her in the background of scenes, she always looks drunk and she's just such a mood. But her behavior with Jackson did start to get on my nerves a bit because she was acting as if she didn't want him, but then got annoyed when he ended up moving on and then she called the girl he was starting to date a slut, but how can you say that when you didn't want him? Like you rejected him. Catherine started dating Mike. Now I don't understand how that happened because it was very rushed and they had no chemistry and started dating after like one episode, so that's bad writing. But if you look past that, Catherine and Mike, regardless of whether it's stupid or not, were dating. Susan really started to get on my nerves in season five. The first incident was when she was irritated that Catherine and her son MJ were bonding. Catherine was doing a great job looking after him. Jackson was in the house all the time around MJ and he was basically a complete stranger to Mike and Mike was okay with it. So I don't see why Susan has a right about getting annoyed, especially because she knows Catherine, has known her for years. She should be comfortable letting Catherine spend time around her kid, you know? At one point, Susan was even considering moving away to live with Jackson and taking MJ with her. And it's not like she'd thought about how that would impact Catherine and Mike, so... She's just really selfish. Another thing that bothers me the more I think about it is the car crash that caused the rift in her relationship between her and Mike. Because she was the one that was driving the car and yet she let Mike take the fall for it. He's already been in jail before, that's another thing to add onto his criminal record. And there was a flashback that showed Susan and Mike in the process of divorcing, signing the papers, and then she suddenly says to him, wait, are we making a mistake? That is not the time to be saying that. You should have brought up 
those feelings earlier and now you're wasting his time and the lawyer's time just as you're about to sign the papers like couldn't you have thought that through why is she only realizing this now they'd already been separated for like a year they're finalizing it and now again she's saying oh but maybe we shouldn't like she's really childish and indecisive and don't even get me started on the whole private school thing with her son MJ he's like nine or ten he's so small he does not need to be at a private school when he's being taught the most elementary of things like one plus one equals two you could literally homeschool him and teach him stuff really well now I understand if he was 13 you don't want him at a public school you want him at a private school because maybe there's a higher level of education there or you're worried that the classrooms are too big in a public school but honestly when he's this young it seems a bit ridiculous to be so set in sending him to this fancy school especially when you literally can't afford it she keeps demanding that Mike works harder which is so dumb because she doesn't have that many skills herself and she doesn't work that hard and it's not just Mike's responsibility to make money she was basically living off child support because she doesn't make enough money from her job he works so much that sometimes he needed Catherine to look after MJ because he has so little time where it really hit the nail on the coffin for me that I was annoyed at her was how the whole love triangle thing happened between her and Catherine and Mike I really hated this storyline and I felt like it was probably the worst subplot in all of season five. Susan got over her initial weirdness about them dating and she said that she was okay with it to Catherine, like, go for it, I don't want Mike anymore. Then, even though she said that, when she realizes that she does indeed like Mike, she keeps trying to say that she likes him and flirt with him a bit, even though she knows that he's with Catherine. I don't have a huge problem with Catherine and Mike getting together. It is weird because Catherine and Susan are friends, but Susan's in a new relationship now and she's divorced from Mike. And everyone dates everyone. Bree starts dating Carl, Susan's ex-husband in season five. So that's kind of how the show works, to be honest. And it doesn't help that Mike really led Catherine on. And it was like he just wanted some sex but he wasn't actually taking her that seriously to be his second backup option in case Susan didn't want him. He was proposing to her and telling her he loved her, but then right in the finale, he drops her immediately to be with Susan. Susan was such a child in that situation though, because she acted like Catherine had stolen Mike from her. Their relationship will fail if you keep getting in the way and sabotaging it like this. She was angry that Brie didn't tell her that Catherine and Mike were dating. She convinced MJ to hate Catherine I do think though that because Susan is so dumb, yes she's selfish but she doesn't think it through. Like I think she's too stupid genuinely to have the capacity to emotionally manipulate someone. She's not really the scheming type. Whereas Mike should have known better in this situation. Catherine said she was thinking of moving away and then Mike said to her, no, please stay. Why tell her to stay if you're not going to take her seriously? And the dumbest thing about this whole love triangle is that when it doesn't work out with Mike, Catherine is angry at Susan. The only person she should really blame here is Mike for leading her on and not communicating with her or thinking stuff through. She literally turned Susan into the other woman or the homewrecker and then put Mike on this pedestal and as because I've seen season six and then spends all of season six trying to get him back. The next character I want to talk about is Edie who's just such an iconic character. She comes back to Wisteria Lane and has this idea in her head that the ladies should have thrown her a wear sorry party, which I think shows a real lack of awareness because why would they do that when you were so rude to them? You're as much in the wrong as they are. And then when she like criticizes their flaws, she's doing the exact same thing herself. So yeah, she's not my favorite character by far, but I still think that she's like way better than a lot of the other characters. I had issues with her in the earlier seasons, but in season five, she was amazing. Just the perfect balance of snarky and witty without being like a bore or stressful to watch. Causing drama, but in a fun way. And I thought she was absolutely shining in season Season five. She seems really happy now she's not with Carlos anymore and that she's apparently happily married to Dave, this mystery man. The way the show starts to treat her is the biggest giveaway that the show is from the early 2000s more specifically because this show sends this message that you can be a kleptomaniac, a diva, a cheater, just don't be slutty. The girls are still ignoring her and not including her. When she experiences a breakup from Dave, the girls don't even really spend much time on it and then they go and hug Susan about something and forget all about Edie. And then they kill her off really brutally, which I felt came out of nowhere. Considering what a major character she is, I was like, 
whoa. There's this cheeky voiceover she's doing, which really takes away from the emotional impact of her death and almost makes it funny. The other women see her die, but they don't actually cry. And then they spend most of the time after that around her funeral, making fun of her and cracking jokes at her expense. They say they should scatter her ashes where she lost her virginity. And then they joke about her plastic surgery and her fake boobs and the amount of guys she slept with, which just leaves a really sour taste in my mouth. Then there's this stupid stupid add-on episode dedicated to explaining how ED came into their lives and influenced all of them in a really beneficial way and the various nice conversations they had in heart to heart. It's like they're adding in all this stuff as an afterthought but those things were never there to begin with. Suddenly they're making out as if they actually were all friends with her which never happened. We find out that Gabby and ED apparently went drinking like friends do together since when that Edie was hanging out with Susan and going jogging with her again since when. I did really like Edie's dynamic with her husband and I'm glad that at least we got to see her married but it made me really sad that the last thing that happened before she died was realizing that Dave wasn't who he claimed to be and that he was a bad guy. The next character I want to talk about is Gabby. She thinks her daughter is too fat and she doesn't know what to do about it. And it makes her reflect upon her own weight gain over the years and how she's not really putting herself together like she used to in terms of her makeup and her hair. And because Carlos is blind, he would have to delegate a lot of tasks to her and cooking. So she has less time to work out, less time to look after herself. And because he's blind, she's hardly motivated to look good because he can't see her. Also, she wants Carlos to get a job as a masseuse, a masseur at her local country club but then she realizes that because this isn't the most high-flying job that they're actually losing their social standing and they're not being invited to the same fancy parties which obviously really hits her ego and Carlos at this point has gone through more of his transformation to being a better person so he feels like the most important thing is family and that all that money was bad for him but Gabby actually doesn't feel the same way and she wants to be successful and admired finally Gabby is annoyed because a member of Carlos's family is sick and can't look after their daughter so that means that they're going to need to adopt Carlos's niece. She's this teenage girl called Anna who's really troubled and she's just going to cause a lot of problems and Gabby isn't that keen at the idea of taking her on. I do feel like Gabby has definitely experienced some character development which was really cool. For example there was this crazy old rich lady who wanted Gabby to be put in her will and to share a lot of money with her as long as her daughters would basically live under her thumb and if she sent them to private school and controlled their lives and the old Gabby would have jumped at the opportunity to get that much money but the new Gabby was like oh actually I don't want to do that because I don't want you to have control over me and my daughters like that. She has some respect for herself and she understands that some things are more important than money. As I mentioned earlier Gabby has gained some weight and she's also she still looks great by the way I think but she's also wearing these really frumpy clothes that are extremely unflattering. I don't know who wears clothes like that. She's basically wearing a tablecloth. What bothers me is her losing her sense of style. I understand not having time to do makeup or exercise or eat well, but really, like her fashion was so bad. That doesn't make sense. She could still wear nice clothes, even though she has less money. That's okay. I have bought so many clothes cheap secondhand or if you go to like a marketplace or a garage sale you can get loads of nice clothes that people are chucking away or you can get stuff from like fast fashion places and things like that where they are just very cheap clothes but they can still look neat and classy. She could have bought drugstore makeup if she couldn't buy super expensive stuff. I have a lot of drugstore makeup and it works just fine for me so I don't believe that she would lose that much of her sense of style even if she is struggling financially even if she is tired. If anything, they could have put her in leggings and a t-shirt or in a cute little camisole like what Susan wears and that would be absolutely fine as well. Another thing that bothers me is the fact that she actually ended up having kids when she didn't want them nor did she ever want them. Wouldn't it be nice to have one of the main women just stay childless? Like why is motherhood always forced on women when they don't want it? Like, what is wrong with society? If she doesn't want kids, that's
that's cool. Also, she is genuinely concerned about her daughter's weight, both their daughter's weight actually. She tried to talk to Carlos about her concerns involving this and I felt like he wasn't a very good husband because regardless of whether he agreed or not about their kid's weight, it's like he wasn't hearing her. You can't apply beauty standards to a child. I'm just saying that if Gabby is worried that her child is medically obese, then maybe that's something Carlos should listen to her about. When Gabby had to coach children for beauty pageants in an earlier season, she was judgmental towards any of the girls who signed up who weren't like a size zero zero, like very thin. And she was talking about a lot of disordered eating and unhealthy approaches to food and a real emphasis on restriction and you can't eat this and you can't eat that. And it's basically all she does. And she notices if she gains weight, she doesn't just become oblivious to it. So I think it's odd that the first time that she started thinking about her daughter's weight was when she overheard other women commenting on their weight saying that she was a bad mom and that she was negligent and then she was like what and then that's when she properly looked at her daughters but I was thinking surely if it bothered you you would have noticed it earlier because you were a model and you were so obsessed with that stuff like that's weird to me also I don't like the way her daughters are written the youngest one never talks ever she says nothing and the older one is so rude like all she does is shovel food in her mouth or she's just being nasty and I get that she's a diva because of course she'd be like her mum but I just don't like her scenes or her sister's scenes like they're such annoying daughters 90% of their scenes revolve around the women commenting on their weight and making fun of their weight or there being some kind of problem with what they're eating and like that's all their characters are made out of like your entire personality is not being hot or being fat or being skinny or being whatever like that's just that's bizarre you're so much more than just your looks okay discuss it in one episode fine but it's mentioned like every time the girls are on screen even in later seasons it's still being brought up I think in season seven, Brie accidentally hits Juanita with her car. And then she says to Gabby, I'm so sorry I hit your daughter. I genuinely didn't see her coming. And Gabby's like, she's my daughter. Trust me, everyone sees her coming because it's another implication like, oh, she's so fat, you can't miss her. And it's constant. Look, I'm all for being healthy. I'm all for taking care of your body or maybe making kids lose weight if you're concerned that they're not eating well or whatever okay because every scene I see of the girls they're eating a lot of ice cream but if that's the case do it respectfully when it's worked into every second sentence it seems a bit much and it's totally played for comedy and again that's quite an early 2000s thing like the fat funny girl because nowadays I hope that we can outgrow that and realize that the fat girl doesn't need to be like the funny one. It's just not very nice. It's not nice when a show opts for cheap fat jokes in the same way that it would make me very uncomfortable if a show was constantly skinny shaming someone or calling them too thin. Moving on from that, another issue I had with Gabrielle's storylines is that she's concerned that she might be pregnant. I think it was in a flashback because Carlos lied to her and told her that he got a vasectomy when he didn't. And he'd also been reluctant to wear a condom. I I can't believe that that's in a show and that's a normalized conversation. She should have divorced him then and there. That alone is a lack of respect for her boundaries and her body. Sure, he apologized and said he felt guilty about it, but why was that even in the storyline? The next girl I want to talk about is Brie. Brie and Catherine now run their successful catering company. Andrew also works for them, which I love. Such a great decision. Like, that's such a cool idea. I love Andrew, by the way. He's probably my favorite character. Brie is about to publish her own cookbook, but Catherine feels like she deserves more credit because a lot of the recipes in there are hers or variations of her stuff she came up with. Danielle had forcefully taken her son Benjamin from Brie years ago when she got married, and Brie's still upset about this because she she kind of felt like Benjamin was her kid even though he's her grandson and so that's really hard because there's this rift in her relationship with her daughter so they don't see each other that often and it means that she doesn't get to see Benjamin that often either. Meanwhile Brie finds out that her son Andrew is dating this guy called Alex and she invites him for dinner and everything and it's really weird because Andrew and Alex seem really happy but then their relationship just disappears in the next season as if nothing happened and we don't even get to see a breakup scene. <laughs> Finally Brie and Carl start dating when she realizes that she needs to divorce Orson. 
I know, it was so sad. I went on and on about how much I like Brie and Orson, but now they're divorcing due to multiple reasons, which is so stupid, I'm going to get into in a minute. And it was probably one of the worst parts of season five. And I do think she's a bit overrated, even though I really loved her in seasons two and three, and I went on and on and on about her. I feel like those seasons were her time to shine, but now not so much. Brie discovers Andrew's dating their doctor, Alex, like I mentioned, and Alex and Andrew were keeping their relationship pretty private and they hadn't told her about it, yet she feels entitled to know everything, even though she'd been so rude about Andrew being gay. I don't know why she would think that he would tell her anything. Brie thinks then that she can dictate when she gets to meet Alex and that he'll come around for dinner when she says so on her terms, which is really selfish and controlling, especially because it would make so much more sense if she just allowed Andrew to introduce his boyfriend when he feels ready, rather than forcing him into doing something he clearly doesn't want to do. I don't know why everyone goes on and on about Susan being selfish, because Brie is so selfish as well. Like, none of these housewives are particularly good people. What Brie did to Orson was one of the worst things that any woman on the show has done to their partners like ever. She sent him off to prison, right? To make sure that he'd be punished for hitting Mike with his car. She sends him off. Oh my god. She's annoyed then when guys at the dinner table are making prison jokes because she's acting as if it's some sort of summer camp for him to reflect and grow. And I'm like, Brie, babes, this isn't a summer camp. This is prison. It's not going to be like a meditation class where he heals and learns from his mistakes. You're sending him into a very dangerous environment that will give him a criminal record. Then when he goes to prison she cries in the corner and I was like are you actually kidding me? That's so pathetic. You sent him there. Another thing that I don't get, Brie has this new job, a cookbook. She's plagiarized Catherine's freaking recipes and she's not apologizing for it and then making money and fame off stuff that 50% isn't actually her stuff and she hasn't even credited Catherine as coming up with it. And then Catherine's reporting to her as like a subordinate or assistant, which makes no freaking sense when you consider their previous dynamic where Catherine was top dog and always wanted to have one over Brie. Why on earth would she be reporting to her now and why have they changed her entire personality? I never liked Catherine in season four, but what I respected about her was that she was a bad ass and she would not take no for an answer and she was no one's pushover. When Brie started drinking again when Orson went back to prison, Catherine was there for her. She moved in with her to take care of her. She was so kind. But then when Catherine needed her and later on when Catherine and Mike were broken up and Catherine was devastated, where was Brie? She failed her. Brie also annoys me because she patronizes Orson when they're still married and she constantly talks down to him as if he's a child and as if he's inferior to her in some way and he's like this puppy dog desperate for her attention. She insults him in front of others or she just does little things to insinuate that he's not good enough. And I didn't even notice that until Andrew's fiance Alex pointed it out and then I thought about it and I was like, yeah, why does she do that? She really doesn't appreciate him. I really adored Brie in season two and three, as I said, but now I still like her and everything, but she's by no means my favorite housewife. She really annoyed me. Her daughter comes by to visit with Benjamin and Brie's acting as if she has some sort of right to Benjamin or to tell him what to do or how to parent him when he's not her kid. He's her grandson. Big difference. The whole point of the grandma is to be doting and give the kid cookies when the mum's not looking and not control what the kid does. That's weird. Because Brie sucks, her daughter Danielle never wants to be there. And then Brie is annoyed. But maybe if she just had a better relationship with her daughter, things would be fine. Benjamin is a lovely kid and Danielle has done an excellent job raising him. And so it really bothers me that Brie's acting like her daughter's failed in her parenting. She's annoyed that Benjamin's homeschooled, she's annoyed that he's a vegetarian, and then she does stuff behind Danielle's back to try and act like his mum. And the way Brie treated Orson, like I said, was the cherry on top of the cake. Brie forced Orson to go to prison for running down Mike, which is so dumb because Mike did not die as a result of the accident. He knew about it and he forgave Orson, so why can't Brie? And when her son Andrew had killed someone, killed someone in a hit and run, it was kept a secret until like season seven. So that's hypocrisy. That makes no sense. So she forces Orson to go to prison, right? And has a cry about it. She refuses to visit him. And we find out that Brie only started visiting him a bit in prison because Edie told her to. And when she gets there, she's like, it's so gross and creepy. It's unhygienic. 
She treats him poorly when he tries to work at her company. Then she cheats on him. Now, because of Orson's criminal record, he can't get a job and he's not respected anymore. And Brie has no empathy about how awful that is and how that would make him feel. And she's talking down to him like she's ashamed of him. Now, I need to talk about Orson for a bit because the way his character was written was so awful to me. He was always one of my favorite characters in the earlier seasons. I thought he was amazing. And now he is one of my least favorite in the whole show because of the way they've just assassinated his character and turned him into this villain when it's no longer authentic. In the earlier seasons, Orson was always the comedic relief, bringing out Bree's best sides, backing her up and just being her support system. And they were so stable and so good together for such a long time that the fact the show would just throw it all away really upsets me. In the same way it really upset me when they just threw away, let's say, Naomi and Max from 90210. It's that kind of vibe. Orson's character just becomes such a douche. Edie dies, right? And she hit like this pole and was electrocuted. But the reason it happened was because of Orson. He was running around at night with the balaclava on and then Edie swerved to avoid him, right? And that was his fault. And yet he never seems to feel grief over the fact that he caused it in a way. Orson starts to become this villain, vindictive, nasty, and working against his wife. He seems so threatened by Bree's success, by the fact that she's independent, a career woman, which is so unattractive. Like he was never sexist like that or disrespectful like that. Why is he doing that now? That's not him. I would understand if he, let's say, resented her for never visiting him in prison, or if he resented her for looking down on him or something, but it's not really that. He resents her because of her success and because of her business. She feels fulfilled and successful and because he doesn't feel fulfilled and successful, he's annoyed at her. Brie doesn't want to sell her business and Orson's like, you should sell it, you should sell it because I want to be the breadwinner and you just sit at home and bake stuff for me. And then Orson starts almost blackmailing her and threatening her saying, I'm gonna start doing bad things. I'm gonna start stealing if you don't sell your business. I'm not gonna be able to help myself. And the stealing, we'll get into that in a minute because he starts stealing. He becomes a kleptomaniac. You don't just become a kleptomaniac. One thing happens with Andrew that annoys him. And so he's like, I'm gonna steal Andrew's pen. I'm gonna steal this, I'm gonna steal that. Who does that? Who wakes up one morning and goes, I'm gonna be a kleptomaniac because I feel bad about my life at the moment. I'm gonna go steal some shit from my friends' houses. Why would you even think to do that? Why would that even cross your mind? I'm sorry I'm yelling. I'm sorry, I need to get some water and take a breather. I'm just so annoyed because it makes no sense. His stealing escalates so much to the point that he breaks into an old woman's house like an actual thief and that's why he was wearing the balaclava. He makes this sexist comment about Brie being fit for a homemaker's role. He wants someone who makes him look good, who doesn't outshine him too much, who makes him feel like the man not someone who intimidates him. He's constantly guilt tripping and emotionally manipulating Brie and stealing even when he knows it upsets her. And then he says that he was stealing instead of talking to her about the relationship problems they were facing. Pressurizes her into making him dinner and the specific cream brulee he wants, even though she'll need to run to the store and grab ingredients and it's late at night. And he's like, I'll wait. Why? For what, Orson? For what? Bree says, would you really want me to sell a business that I spent years building that makes me feel joy and a sense of accomplishment? And he says, yes. She should have literally divorced him then and there. That's unbelievable. I just wrote that down because when I heard that line, I was blown away. He then gets obsessed with the fact that she pays Andrew more than him, which is also dumb because Andrew's been there for longer. So of course, Andrew would be paid more. And Orson was only hired after manipulating her into it. So of course, he's not gonna be paid lows. After he breaks into the old woman's house, he doesn't want her to report him. So he goes to the hospital and convinces the doctor that the old woman had dementia and that she's making up this story about him breaking into her house. I read an article where they'd interviewed the actor about his character and he said he was initially written as a villain. And that explains why he had such insanely sinister vibes in season three and the end of season two. 
but then they went down the happy marriage route with him and Brie and he became a nice guy and that was a decision they made. He said that he wanted to be a series regular but he actually wanted a villain storyline because that's what he was originally hired for and he thought he'd do a good job. So I guess that's what they're trying to do now is turn him into a villain so he gets a chance to play that role but that's dumb. It doesn't work. Sorry, babes. Brie never forgave Orson for hitting Mike with his car. She said she did, but she never really did, and their relationship was never the same after she found that out. She only took him back because Danielle took the baby Benjamin away, so she didn't want to be alone. But then when her business took off and she was successful, she completely forgot about Orson because she had another love, another passion to focus on, and she didn't feel so lonely anymore. But I don't think she ever really loved him after she found out about what he did, which I find really upsetting because people do all sorts of crazy stuff in this show. It's a soap opera, but I think for the writers to just give up on their relationship altogether is sad. And no matter who she dates, Carl, someone else, it won't be the same as how it was with her and Orson. The final character I want to talk about, the final housewife, is Lynette. Lynette's husband Tom is having a serious midlife crisis. He's wanting to do all sorts of crazy stuff he's never done before and as a result they're not really a partnership anymore. It's more just him going off and doing his own thing and annoying her or it's him crying about how he's depressed and not successful and her needing to constantly soothe him and rub his back and be like oh baby it's okay no no you are amazing you are successful no no you're you're doing so well i'm not even exaggerating just soothing him and he's another child effectively he's a burden tom comes up with a plan to replace his employees with his kids because they're having financial troubles but his kids refuse to appreciate his work and how hard he tries and so he has this seriously angry outburst and starts throwing his son around like this and shaking him by the shoulders and it was very uncharacteristic for Tom to get violent like that. Lynette starts suspecting that he's maybe having an affair with Anne Schilling, Porter's friend's mother, but it's actually Porter, her teenage son, who's sleeping with Anne, who's a grown woman, like 45. Lynette uses her emergency fund, even though they're having financial issues, to bribe Anne into leaving town and never being in contact with Porter again. The woman Anne had basically faked a pregnancy in order to try and get Porter to stay with her. It was a very, very interesting storyline. Also Porter is like targeted and framed for being the one that started the fire even though Dave started it. Then at the end of the season Lynette discovers that she may be pregnant and there's a high chance that she'll give birth to twins again. I've thought a lot about Lynette's character so far and although she has a lot of issues I do think people are way too harsh on her. Like she has so many great qualities that get overlooked. Considering how hard her job is I don't blame her for being a bit highly strung and my point is I don't think she's any worse than any of the other housewives. They're all desperate housewives. They're all flawed, messy characters. Tom's midlife crisis was one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen. And I've tried to like him really hard. And now at this point when I'm recording season five, I have to say like, I just really hate his character. I think he's probably one of my least favorites in the whole show. And I just think he gets so many free passes because he's a guy, but she's the only one handling stuff like an adult rather than indulging in his childish fantasies about going off to Europe for a year in a van or whatever it was. A lot of their issues in their relationship end up being painted as Lynette's fault, even though it's both their faults. Tom was a loser in high school and it's like now he's rewarding his teenage sons for breaking the rules and living out his fantasies from when he was a teenager. Lynette's the bad cop and Tom's the good cop when it comes to parenting their kids and I think that's unfair that Lynette is the only one brave enough to properly discipline them. There's more statutory, statutory, statuary rape. I'm so bad at saying that and it's this time Lynette's son Porter who's sleeping with his best friend's mom who looks about 45 like I said Anne. And that is her grooming him. And she's claiming they're in love, but they're not. It's literally a repeat of Gabby and John from season one. But this time, apparently, we're meant to think it's horrible and not right, because why? Is it because the bad guy is a woman we don't really know, so it's okay to villainize her? But then why was it okay when Gabby did that? 
Like, is it because she's the main character? It's okay that she does it. But the way it was revealed was hilarious because Lynette thought that Tom was cheating on her with Anne. And so she told him, you know, I found out the truth. I know what's going on. And Tom was confused. And he thought that she meant that Porter was dating someone and it was this miscommunication. So Lynette was like, I know what you know. I know what the truth about everything. And Tom was like, oh, do you? I'm glad you found out eventually. And then he like starts laughing and whips out this can of beer saying, oh what can I say boys will be boys I can guarantee it's happened once and it'll happen again because he thinks that he's talking about teenage boys pursuing relationships and Annette's even more like horrified because she thinks he's saying yeah boys will be boys I cheated on you and I'll do it again and she's like oh, what did you just say to me and it was absolutely hilarious he realizes they're talking about two completely different things and he's like wait what are you talking about? And it was so funny. But Tom's behavior in season five, aside from that very funny scene, is really disgusting because he's always been a man child, but somehow it's harder now to actually stomach it. Lynette was so understanding for the most part about his midlife crisis, aside from one thing where she was a bit unnecessarily snarky about him joining a band and she broke his freaking guitar, which was so toxic of her. But aside from that, she was pretty understanding and gentle with him when it came to his midlife crisis, even though it was pathetic and he was wallowing in his own misery for like the whole season. He was thinking of selling his pizzeria so he can travel for a year. He wanted to get plastic surgery to look younger. He's saying what I wouldn't give to date a 17 year old. But when he really crosses the line is how emasculated he becomes when it involves Lynette. He kept accusing her of keeping things from him and not giving him a chance to succeed when he failed at a job interview. And it was all on him, but he blamed her for it. He's intimidated by her power, her business success, her boldness. And so he starts moping and whinging when Lynette gets a business opportunity, even though it was a business opportunity that he turned down. And so when Lynette says, well, I'll do the job, he's like, what? No. Uh. And so he starts competing with her over it like their children. Then they do this challenge for 30 days of sex to try and bring them closer as a couple. And around 20 days in, Lynette can't do it anymore and she's literally so sleep deprived and she wants a break. But then Tom gets really annoyed and starts whinging and saying, please, please, as if he's a child. And he's actually annoyed at her that she didn't want to do it like on the 20th day in and then the next morning he refuses to make her pancakes or something as like this passive aggressive way of letting her know that he's displeased with her and he'd even come into her work when she was working to try and make sure they had sex that day when she told him not to do that. It's sexual coercion. I don't care how long you've been together. You never have a right to someone's body or to assume that they would even want to do that with you. So so yeah, I found that genuinely so annoying and I think Lynette deserves better than him. I know she's got her issues. I know that sometimes she's rude to him, but I think one of the biggest reasons as to why she does that is because she's sick of his stupid childish ideas. And so when he says stuff like, I feel like you don't listen to me, of course she doesn't listen to you. You're an idiot. Why would she listen to a thing you say? And so it makes me sad when people blame Lynette for stuff. Like a friend says you should be more compassionate towards Tom or a relationship therapist says that she needs to be more compassionate because it takes two to tango and I don't think Lynette is solely responsible for him being an idiot. But you know, despite those things I talked about, I thoroughly enjoyed season five. I thought it was so much fun. Like I really enjoyed it. I thought the mystery was better than season four's mystery overall. And yeah, I'm actually really excited for the final seasons and to talk to you guys about everything. So yeah, make sure you stay tuned for that and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And I will see you for my next video. I'll see you guys next Tuesday.